<laughs> All right, so my dad was born in 1922, one of four children, and he grew up in Ponsatawney, Pennsylvania. He nor his family ever went to church. His father died of a heart attack when my dad was <laughs> and his mother lived the rest of her days pretty isolated in her small town, her, her small home, watching soap operas and drinking buttermilk. Uh, my dad went to college and joined the Air Force, and he served as a fighter pilot in World War II and the Korean War. So anyway, I was saying, I don't remember any formal reference to religion. How they lived out their faith, loving God with generosity and kindness, humor and self-sacrifice. I was born in Palo Alto, California in 1965, the youngest of six children. And my control has been taken away from so me. You're gonna so have to Emily's gonna have to do this slide for you. Um, I had two sisters two half-brothers, and a half-sister. My dad had been married and had three young children born very close together. His wife was then institutionalized for the rest of her life with what we would term today as postpartum psychosis. Mm -hmm. Struggling as a single parent with little help from my nana, he soon met and married my mom, and they went on to have three girls. At birth, I had several medical issues to overcome, pyloric stenosis, which was a clogged digestive tube. I had an ABO blood incompatibility, and I had milk allergies. Mm -hmm. So I guess you could say resilience is in my DNA. <laughs> we lived in California until I was five. My memories for that time include our family pet, Duke, and my fifth birthday party. I don't remember ever going to church. My mom had been raised Catholic and my dad was an atheist. My oldest sister had just gotten married after graduating from high school, so she stayed in California. But my parents and the rest of us moved to Potomac, Maryland in 1970. Although a year apart in age, my brothers were both seniors in high school, so they weren't pleased to be moving across the country for their senior year. From this point, I had many amazing memories of a blessed childhood. We enjoyed family vacations, big Christmases, where my sisters and I wore matching nightgowns, <laughs> swimming and ice skating lessons, gymnastics, horseback riding, recess with my friends, and running all over the neighborhood until dark. I was very active and I was always busy. I also remember attending church and Sunday school at Fourth Presbyterian, where my mom had become a member. As I mentioned, my mom was raised Catholic, but after a brief first marriage and divorce before she had met my dad, the story goes she was kicked out of the Catholic church, and I guess became Presbyterian. <laughs> <laughs> my sisters occasionally came to church with my mom and I. My brothers weren't around much that first year, and then were both in college at University of Maryland, where they became born again Christians. They evangelized to my dad, all the time and it drove him crazy. <laughs> I was intrigued by their confidence and ability to talk to anyone willing to listen about their faith and about Jesus, the one who saves. When I was in fifth grade at Carter Rock Springs Elementary, one of my close friends and classmates, Brent Bishop, was murdered. He was bludgeoned to death by his father, mm -hmm. who also killed Brent's older and younger brother mm. and his mother and grandmother. Mm -hmm. They never caught his father and he remained on the FBI most wanted list for decades. Mm -hmm. After that, I couldn't shake the bizarre feeling that I was afraid of my own father, who was rarely home and always traveling for business. Moving on from that horrible experience, I started junior high, clearly another horrible experience, <laughs> and then became involved in weekly youth group and a Bible study. And I remember feeling safe and accepted. I have great memories of fun youth group retreats and service projects, a sense of belonging, and especially at the time that I invited Jesus into my heart, hmm. acknowledging his sacrifice for my sins and receiving his invitation for salvation and forgiveness. I remember writing my faith statement during confirmation and feeling at home whenever I was in the presence of my church family. It was also during this time that I discovered worship music and that provided an extra layer of connection between me and scripture and what I believed. Everything felt so right and according to a good plan. I was a chameleon and seemed to get along with just about everybody, friends at school, sports, and church. Because many of my friends were Jewish, I had the opportunity to attend some awesome bar and bar mitzvahs. <laughs> I knew some of my friends were experimenting with smoking and drinking, but they knew that I wasn't interested and that was okay. Yep, junior high in Montgomery County. <laughs> my middle sister was a big partier. 
and I told on her every chance I could get. <laughs> my mom had to carry all the parenting burdens because, as I mentioned, my dad was gone a lot, and I figured his absence was normal. Then one spring night when I was in eighth grade, my parents and I went out to dinner at the Japan Inn in Georgetown. They told me they were getting a divorce, and they were sorry they couldn't wait four more years until I graduated from high school. My middle sister was graduating that year, so I was going to be the only one left at home. There was painful irony in my dad's choice of restaurants. The reason for the divorce was that my dad had had a mistress for a few years that he was supporting in San Diego, someone that he had met during one of his many business trips to Japan and who had left her husband and young children to be with my father in the United States. Apparently everyone in the family knew about it except for me. I thought it was normal to have a father that was gone a lot. And it occurred to me that I never saw or heard my parents argue but they also didn't really communicate either. My world as I knew it did a complete pivot from happiness and confidence, a life filled with many friends, uncomfortable routines, to anger and a sense of abandonment. I felt stupid and naive. I didn't blame God for the circumstances, but I didn't maintain a very good relationship with him either. I remember thinking the rules for the game of life had changed. And in, I no longer felt safe to count on anyone or anything, and that included God. I said goodbye to my dad, who lived his business to moved his business to Tokyo with his soon-to-be new wife, Rhea. I didn't see or hear from him for the next four years. I also had to say goodbye to all of my friends at school and my neighborhood and church, and basically goodbye to my youth. I flew by myself to San Francisco to start my ninth grade year, living with my Catholic aunt and uncle and four cousins waiting for my mom to sell our house in Potomac, pack up our belongings, and drive cross country to start our new chapter. It ended up taking her nine long months. Mm -hmm. During that time, I strayed from my faith and didn't have a youth group or church that I could connect with. I struggled with the unfamiliar church experience and atmosphere. I resented being told that I had to go through the priest to get to God, not to mention that I wasn't allowed to have communion. This was not the God of my understanding who walked beside me and was my friend. I allowed the confusion to cloud my faith and question what I really believed. Then I stopped going altogether. At the end of my sophomore year, my mom had met someone and remarried, and I did not get along very well with my stepfather. That left me with a lot of freedom and independence. Not a good combination at the age of 16 with little faith direction. I became a typical wild child. I did some crazy things, took a lot of risks, and in hindsight, God was clearly there protecting me. We used to hike a lot and hang out in the Berkeley Hills. A good friend of mine was with her boyfriend, climbing one weekend, slipped and fell to her death. Oh. Another loss of someone my age, which seems so senseless. That experience was devastating to my friends and I. My mom and stepfather attended church and were involved in their faith community. However, I was not. I honestly remember feeling so disappointed that I didn't want my relationship with God anymore because things had gone so wrong. I couldn't see or appreciate that he was present. It had a plan for my life and that he would never abandon me. After high school graduation in 1983, life took another sharp turn. I barely lasted my first semester at Chico State. I was forced to take a medical leave after dropping to 90 pounds. That's what not eating and over exercising will do for you. Enter Philippians 413. During that time, I deceived myself that I was in control, not God. Clearly, I was completely out of control. It took a six week inpatient program to get more physically, mentally, and emotionally healthy, and to draw me closer to an acceptance of the things that I couldn't change, a belief that God still had my back, and that with him, all things were possible. That newly energized faith was unfortunately unsustainable as I was still disconnected from my dad and other family members, and I didn't fully trust that I was worthy of what God had planned for my life. That spring in 1984, I bought a one-way ticket to DC to attend my sister Lynn's wedding at Fourth Presbyterian. I never went back to California. I somehow found a full-time job working for a local attorney, rented an efficiency apartment filled with cockroaches in downtown DC, and went paycheck to paycheck. determined to make it on my own. Again, in hindsight, it's clear that God was there protecting and providing. I was reconciled with my mom and stepfather and with my dad and stepmother and other family members, but I still wasn't willing or ready to reconcile my faith. 
Now it's 1986 and I've found a rhythm, yet I'm still a churchless, woefully independent adult. I let someone into my life who was kind and fun and tolerated my idiosyncrasies and character defects. Tom and I became great friends before we started dating. Together, we enjoyed our careers, skiing, sailing, traveling, and adventure. We dated for five years before Tom surprised me and asked me to marry him. We had to figure out a place to get married, though, since neither of us attended church. Technically, I was Presbyterian and Tom was Catholic, so we compromised and we chose an Episcopal church downtown. <laughs> we attended the required marriage counseling sessions and were married at St. John's Episcopal Church on June 20th, 1992. We attended infrequently after our wedding, as it wasn't convenient to go into the city every Sunday from where we lived in Falls Church, Virginia. Unfortunately, that pretty much describes its level of importance at that time. We then moved to Potomac in 1993 and were blessed with Victoria Noel in December 1993. Sadly, Tom's mother passed after complications from a stroke shortly after Victoria was born. Then a few months later, my stepfather, who I'd always had a strange relationship with, passed away after a short battle with cancer. God gives and he takes away. Amanda Grace was born on November 18th, 1995. And we had the privilege of having Tom's father, who by then was succumbing to the challenges of Alzheimer's, live with us briefly during that time. The girls brought him much joy. He passed away when both girls were still very young. So another sad time for our family. The girls were both baptized when they were each around nine months old at the same church we were married in, since we had yet to even consider church attendance or membership a priority anywhere else. Although baptism was keeping up with what I felt we should be doing as Christian parents, I still was not living or rooted in my faith. I still carried a lot of guilt and pain from my past. I was the gift that kept on giving to the enemy, continuously struggling with unbelief and doubt and emptiness, wanting to believe, to trust, and to feel grateful. Over the next several years, Tom and I had hoped to grow our family, but instead we experienced three painful miscarriages. I was left feeling physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually bankrupt. First Kings 19 verses 11 to 12 reads, then a very strong wind blew, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a quiet, gentle voice. Finally, after all the storms in my life thus far, I listened to that quiet voice and I surrendered my life to God's care. I was willing and ready to be transformed, giving up control or lack of it and trusting in someone or something bigger than, my, bigger than myself was scary. But by God's grace, I found forgiveness and hope and comfort in his promises. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. In her sermon on March 27th, Pastor Emily summed it up this way. When you and I are lost, we do not need to remain in that grief, struggle, tailspin, lostness. There is one who with joy, with ounce strings attached is there for us calling us home calling us to wholeness, calling us back to our senses and loving us in the midst of it all. After emerging from that dark season, Tom and I prioritized finding a church where we could take our two young girls to learn about God and Jesus and where I hoped I could continue to rebuild my own faith foundation. We were greeted with open arms and caring hearts here at Potomac Presbyterian. I can remember feeling fragile and, fragile and spiritually immature but I received love and acceptance and encouragement and this house of worship felt like home. Gradually, I began to find strength and hope in scripture and comfort from worship and in the fellowship of other Christians. God's plan seemed to include a bigger family after all. And in 2002, the same year we became members at PPC, we welcomed Chandler Thomas into our family. I volunteered and served in various leadership roles at PPC, and we participated in many of the activities and worship opportunities. Then another fork in the road. I was soon to be 40 and was pregnant with what we hoped would be the final blessing to our family. 
During a routine prenatal visit on a Thursday in September, the doctor told me the pregnancy was not viable. There was no heartbeat and we would need to schedule a BNC. This was not my first rodeo and I was devastated. At least this time, I, my faith was able to turn to God in prayer, pleading for courage and comfort. Tom was on travel for a week and I was scheduled to give a speech in front of the parents and teachers at Travilla Elementary that evening at back to school night. Mm -hmm. The doctor told me he required a second ultrasound before he would go forward with the procedure. And because of our insurance, it had to be done at a different location and was then scheduled for the following Monday with the DNC scheduled for Tuesday. Only with a piece that surpasses all understanding and with God's arms wrapped around me, did I make it through my speech that night at back to school night and the following night at the back to school picnic and a very long, sad weekend. The technician on Monday thought I was there to see beautiful images of my baby and couldn't understand why I wouldn't look at the screen and was so upset. I couldn't vocalize my pain and disappointment to a total stranger. He then pointed at the screen and excitedly identified a heartbeat. A total miracle, God's miracle. <laughs> Preston David was born in the following <laughs> April. <laughs> <laughs> Through my hills and valleys, I am reminded that I can pray earnestly for what I think I want and desperately for what I think I need, but God's plan will always prevail. I've learned to pray for serenity, for a heart perspective that equips me to accept outcomes that don't align with what I envision for myself and my family. It replaces a lot of headstrong disappointment. <laughs> My mom gave me a small plaque that I cherish with a familiar quote by Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift, that's why it's called the present. Being present takes intentionality and being grateful for each day the Lord has made. Gratitude can be like a light bulb and is a necessary resource to counter darkness. Whenever I am in a hole, I have the choice to look down and dig deeper or look up and see the light. Speaking of light, I wrote a devotional years ago about the view from above the clouds. I'm not gonna read it now, but it came from a realization that heaven is pure light and no matter how cloudy or overcast or stormy the skies are here on earth, there's always light above it all. An excerpt from the devotional 100 Days of Hope and Encouragement says, the Bible reminds us that God holds it all, past, present, and future in his hands. He holds us in his hands. We are intimately known and deeply loved by him. We are forgiven. He has great plans and purposes for us, and he equips us with everything we need to accomplish these things. And we are never alone. He leads us and guides us every step of the way. He blesses our lives and fills our hearts with hope. I feel very blessed to be a member of a loving family and supportive family, and to have church, a church where my kids have thrived and grown in their own faith. All four of my children have attended confirmation classes here at PPC and received Jesus into their hearts. My kids have participated in numerous mission trips, and I even had the privilege to be part of the youth and adult team from PPC that served in West Virginia last summer. About four years ago, I had the opportunity at a seminar to see my former youth pastor from Fourth Presbyterian, and I thanked him for planting the seed, for without that faith foundation, I may never have found my way back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. J.J. Heller lifts up a beautiful prayer to her children in her song, Hand to Hold. May you never lose the wonder in your soul. May you always have a blanket for the cold. May the living light inside you be the compass as you go. May you always know you have my hand to hold. Mm -hmm. So my mom was and always will be my big, biggest faith mentor, prayerful, courageous, compassionate, and resilient. Kleenex for this part, just in case I need it. She passed away, a long, passed away after a long battle with a blood disorder of myelofibrosis, and she also had lymphoma on the Sunday before Thanksgiving 20 years ago. And I still miss her every day. Because of what I believe, I'm confident I will see her again. My dad, who had survived emergency quadruple, quadruple bypass surgery just days before my mom passed away, and then was diagnosed with Parkinson's, also passed away on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, five years after my mom did. My dad asked Jesus into his heart um, and asked to be baptized just weeks before his death. 
I'm grateful for that miracle and the promise that he is in heaven. He wanted one of his children to read the 23rd Psalm at his funeral, and I was honored to fulfill that request. It has weighed on my heart that my kids have grown up without grandparents. Our children were too young or not born yet when Tom's parents passed away. Victoria and Amanda have sweet memories of my mom and dad from when they were very young, but my boys never knew them. I'm grateful for the intergenerational activities and kindness and mentoring shown to my kids by members of our faith community. Our most recent losses have been Tom's only sibling, his sister Marilyn, who also suffered from Alzheimer's and passed away in 2019, and my brother Richard, who died after a sudden heart attack in September of 2020. So my adult faith has sustained me through life's hills and valleys and taught me about inevitable pain, optimal misery, optional misery, and invincible joy. The most amazing thing I realize every day is that I, I am a child of God most dear, and that nothing I do will make him love me any more or any less. I'm fully known. I am promised in scripture that all things according to his will are possible through Christ, who gives me strength, and that no matter what my circumstances, it will all be okay because God is with me. Prayer is what keeps me connected and service is what maintains my sense of purpose. A big part of my Christian faith discipline is to pray, to share fellowship with my faith family, to serve in my community, and to spend time in the Word. Studying scripture helps me to grow in my understanding and to find comfort, <coughs> encouragement, and guidance in my life. There are many verses in the Bible referencing light, which help me to seek and recognize God in my life and to be aware of the enemy who can only exist in my darkness. I claim the literal messages found in scripture about love and forgiveness and endurance and compassion. Because it is a journey, my faith continues to change shape, texture, temperature. In fact, it was a journey just writing this thing, <laughs> evoking memories and thoughts and feelings that I've not visited in a long time. Most recently, I've been challenged to maintain my prayer discipline in quiet time. To quote a known Christian singer, Matthew West, I realized I tend to spend a lot of time talking about God and not enough time talking to God. Hmm. On a regular basis, I enjoy listening to contemporary Christian music at home and in my car. I pick from one of several daily devotional emails I receive to read and reflect on. I often choose from several Christian podcasts to listen to when I walk my dog, Lily. I know I'm called to actively engage in worship and fellowship with PPC. Also, for the past 15 years, I've participated in a weekly Bible study class with study questions and teaching and served in leadership for seven of those years. I'm enjoying running, hiking, biking, or walking. Being physically active helps keep me centered. And I like to think of the Holy Spirit's presence as my oxygen. Mm -hmm. I trained for my first marathon in 2013 and was feeling very anxious at the starting line. When I noticed the person in front of me had Philippians 4.13 printed on the back of their shirt. <laughs> An amazing reminder right when I needed it most. Mm -hmm. All things are possible through Christ who strengthens me. I followed that run runner as long as I could. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it was a lot faster than I was. <laughs> uh, but I kept the message with me the whole way. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for all the God moments I experience when I'm paying attention and that make me feel alive. The following spring, I was signed up to run in the Boston Marathon. Fortunately, during my training, I suffered a stress fracture and was in a boot for six weeks, not ideal training gear. Mm -hmm. I was only able to begin walking and short distance jogging without the boot about three weeks before the race. My doctor told me at the outset, I wouldn't be running in the marathon. I still have a problem hearing the word no. <laughs> so I didn't take his prediction to heart and I prayed and did what I could to prepare in spite of my restricted abilities. Waiting with all the other runners at the start, Guess what happened to be right in front of me? Another runner with my verse on his back. Yeah. What an incredible God moment. So I recited Philippians 4.13 the whole way and I finished the race. Mm -hmm. To God be all the glory. Mm -hmm. Of course, I could barely walk the next day, but that's beside the point. <laughs> God doesn't guarantee we won't feel pain or discomfort. In fact, that is where the growth happens. God doesn't make the journey easier, but he does make it better. He not only makes promises, he's a promise keeper. Speaking of running, I've always loved to run as a child at recess, track and cross country in junior high and high school and jogging as an adult. It's occurred to me recently that I spent a large part of my life running away from my fears and struggles. But with age and God's grace, I now run towards his direction and plan for me. Similarly, I 
let go of fighting against my past and fighting for my present. An ongoing struggle for me is to turn up the volume of the wholehearted voice that comes from the Holy Spirit and to quiet as much as possible the discouraging voice in my head that I know doesn't originate from God. Mm -hmm. The worship band Casting Crowns has a song entitled Held. In the lyrics, it is God speaking to me, challenging me to stop trying to hold on and to just be held. It's an awesome image for me to be held in the arms of my Lord. And here's a music video of that song. <laughs> but, uh, I guess, uh, and just listening to your whole story, which is just amazing, and uh, not knowing that story, but knowing your family since you've been here at church, and your just family is just fantastic. Your, your four kids and, and the success they've had, I mean, it's just so clear that you have lived in your faith with Tom as well, and your family has also grown in that, that context. But my question is, as, as you talk through your life story, mm -hmm. you said, I now realize looking back a few times, mm -hmm. maybe not exactly those words, but yeah. that was your intent. And I'm just curious as to, uh, given where you are now, which we're all in that kind of situation where we reflect back on ourselves, mm -hmm. but from your perspective, looking back, when did that realization really start happening? Has it really been at this point or in the past few years? or maybe, you know, maybe the past decade or so, that you've looked back on your earlier phases of your life where you had all of these tragic situations happen to you. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I imagine you were, you know, very upset and you didn't really think God was there. You even said as much. Right. So when did you start really evolving a perspective in that regard in terms of God being present even back when these tough things were happening? Um. I think just so that, that is a hard question, by the way. <laughs> um, okay, Tom, I guess I, so, I don't know. I mean, I guess that I, um, so Matthew West on his podcast, he at the end, he asked his, his, um, his guest, your blue couch moment, because he was sitting on a blue couch, Billy Graham, um, he was looking for a baseball game, and a blue Billy Graham crusade came up on the TV. And he actually like listened to it. His father was a preacher, so he figured he already had the ticket to heaven so he wasn't really invested in his faith as a, as a child and this just spoke to him so that was his blue couch moment and I've had um my faith I think in looking back and in writing this first of all I am in, like incredibly grateful I think it's so important to have a faith foundation because the building can get knocked down but the foundation is still there and in my case the building got knocked down several times and you know what because of that faith foundation, I will honestly say that I always like knew God was there. I just didn't want him. I didn't want to receive it. I wasn't worthy. I had a lot of shame. I had a lot of guilt and I couldn't receive his love, but I feel like I've always, and I'm grateful for this. I've kind of always known he was there, you know, and I, I, I um, probably didn't emphasize it enough here, but I never blamed God for anything that happened to me. Mm -hmm. I am, because of my personality, I'm very strong-willed, very independent, and that can work, that can be a positive and a negative. And it worked against me in the sense that because of what happened with my parents, like everything was like great, and then bam. And that's where I can really pinpoint my, the beginning of my downfall chapter one, which was just like, because I thought God was like part of that. And so I, I didn't blame him for any of that, but I was like, but I thought because I like everything's so awesome that that's how it's always supposed to be. And so it's taken me a long time to fully realize that God doesn't make life perfect. Mm -hmm. He doesn't guarantee us anything. He gives us free will. So, and and I welcome the discomfort now. Like I've welcomed the struggles because I know that I am growing through that process, you know? So just to circle back, like I didn't ever blame God and knew he was there, but unfortunately there's a part of me that is, that works against my, my best interests. And so I, I wouldn't allow myself to feel that way. And I just found reasons to not go his way and to go my way, almost like, you know, when I, when I got sick, I mean, I knew I was killing myself basically by not eating and over-exercising. I mean, I was, so I was 30 pounds less than I am right now. 
And so I, you know, it's for me, it's really been, it's been really hard for me to fully accept the fact that I am worthy of love and being saved. And that was that turning point for me after the miscarriages. I was like, well, of course I miscarried you because like, I, mean, I wasn't a martyr, but I was like, because I'm not, I don't deserve another kid, you know? So like, I just have a lot of weird feelings going on. And it was, I mean, truly, I mean, I probably should have been in therapy when I wasn't. <laughs> There's a lot of great resources available for people when they're struggling. And for me, I mean, it was like, it was God. Like, I am so grateful because he truly just lifted that, uh, that veil from me of that, that precluded me from really being able to accept him fully and be fully known. And so that was the turning point for me really was, and then joined becoming members here and just like literally surrendering to receiving God's love and, and, and being okay with that. Thank you. And then the faith foundation that our kids have gotten here. It's just totally awesome. But you know, what, from what Bob said, you also raised the quiet voice situation that you heard that quiet voice that yeah, I, I heard this thing on another podcast. Like, I'm sorry, but I just listened to a lot of different stuff. And this guy was so funny. He, um, he said, so his quiet time's really loud. And I was like, oh my gosh, I so relate to that. You know, like, I'm so, I wish my quiet time's very like quiet, but I'm just a loud, like things are loud. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, so that quiet voice, I... It's a workout for me to really answer <laughs> that quiet voice. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, it's a big, big, big story. And we have received uh, with some people that we came in the too late, we didn't realize. But I uh, just want to. Uh, I saw my wife sharing a small tear. Which means it's a great story. And uh, the focus together. Let's thank God. Yeah. Allow me to pray now. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God Almighty, we just want to express our gratitude to you, Lord, for who you are. Great God indeed. God who loves us so much, Lord. We just receive, Lord, the testimony, Lord, coming from our sister here about your goodness, Lord. She could have been somewhere else, not here. But now, Lord, as you not stretch your merciful hand upon her, we just want to say thank you, Lord. And uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, you coming down to this world for people like us, Lord, to save us. People who were bound to go to hell because of that fall of Adam. But because of your mercy, Father, God Almighty, Jesus Christ came to break the, all, the wall of enmity between us and you. We are grateful, Lord, for such a testimony. Lord, we thank you. We honor you. We, we just are overwhelmed, Lord because of your goodness. My prayer this morning, Lord, that this experience should be for each one of us, Lord, that will have a story to tell, a testimony, that at one time in my life, I encountered Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Be, be glorified. Thank you for this church, Lord, which welcomed her when she was Almost, Lord, not knowing where to put her, her feet, Lord. At least she found welcoming hands in this church. Lord, we pray for this church, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that this spirit will continue, that every one of us, Lord, here will encounter you and be in a relationship with you, Lord. That even in our quiet time, Lord, you will be loud and clear. 
be with God. I thank you, Lord. I commit and their family, Lord. The children will never go astray, Lord. That, Lord, you will keep them, you will guard over them, Lord, so that, Lord God Almighty, their story, Lord, will be like their mother's Lord. Then they will meet you, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to the name. In the precious name of God. Amen. 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 I am so, so glad you're here this morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Daniel, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> it, it, I mean, and said it so much more eloquent. We are really grateful and moved by your vulnerability with us, your willingness to share yourself with us. That makes us a stronger community. And that makes us stronger in our faith when we are privy to that kind of openness in sharing <laughs> how God is at work in your life. So we, uh, along with Daniel, I praise God for your sharing. This is something that we've been doing. Many of you know um, this year is inviting people to <laughs> be vulnerable and to share how God's at work in, in our lives. Um, and Wendy's modeled for it. Bob, all of you who have shared in beautiful and moving ways have modeled, have modeled community for us and have modeled how God is alive for us. We're so grateful for your testimony. Thank you yeah. for listening. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'd appreciate your feedback for how you think meeting in the library works compared to fellowship hall. You know, we go back and forth and we try to figure it out. So um, it's a continual work in progress. Oh, did you find a bowl? Okay, I'm going to end you this.